Okay, this is the lecture video for Mac 1114 Trigonometry. We're in section 9.2, and in this section, we're going to take a look at polar equations and their graphs. You see several examples of polar equa equations grouped according to their families in the table below. This will just give you an idea of the kind of graphs that you're going to be looking at. Okay, when, and they all have different forms and based on the form that the equation is given in, just like in your algebra classes when each form suggests a different shape. And the same thing is true of these polar equations. When the trig function is first degree, coefficient out front, our variable is in its first degree form, you're getting circles. And the A value that you see out front here is the di diameter of the circle. Now you're going to be doing these in the calculator, but just to give you an idea of what to look for so that you can tell whether you're seeing the entire graph or not. That's why you always want to study the form of an equation and what kind of shape that suggests. When you see the R in its squared form, as you see here and here, this will be some constant, A stands for a constant, some constant squared. And if you have sine of 2 theta, notice that in both of these lemniscate shapes that look like infinity symbols, you'll have um, 2 theta. If you have cosine of 2 theta, it will have an orientation around the x-axis. And if you have sine of 2 theta, it will present partly in quad 1, partly in quad 3. And then the A value um, here is just how long each of these petals are. Okay, next in this next row, we see the Limachon family, and you have various uh, types of Limachons here, which I have um, written some extra little notes here for you. The way it's presented in your book is that you will get this Limachon with an inner loop. You have a big loop and you have an outer loop. If you have this kind of equation, you'll have an A value, then either a plus or a minus, not both. The trig function will be in its linear form. The R will be in its linear form. So if you have something of this nature where the A value, this is a constant and so is this. So if that A value that comes before the sign is less than the B value, that's when you get the inner loop. That's the same thing as this comment. And, um, you know, just if you were doing this by hand, um, you would take the bigger value minus the smaller value and you would get the inner loop. And then, you, or, and when you add the two values, you get how long the outer loop is. So just subtracting bigger value minus the smaller value, you'll know how far to go out for the inner loop. And like I just said, that also gives you information about how far to go out. Uh, for the outer loop if you were doing it by hand. Any of these graphs, uh, typically when they have the word cosine in them, they have a uh, polar axis orientation. That, the polar axis is just another name we give to the x-axis when we're graphing polar equations. So when you see um, the trig word cosine of theta, the trig function cosine theta, it's typically going to wrap around the x-axis or have symmetry with respect to what we call the polar axis rather than the x-axis. And when you see that it has the trig function sine of theta in the equation, then it typically wraps around the y-axis or what we call the line theta is equal to pi over 2. That's how we refer to this uh, vertical axis when we're talking polar equations. Okay, uh, another kind of Limachon. This one does not have an inner loop, and that is when this A value is equal to B value. Picture you're seeing here would be from an equation like this containing the trig function cosine. That's why you're seeing orientation about the polar axis, which is this axis right here, this horizontal axis. So when the A and the B value are equal, it takes away that inner loop. Next, we come to a different kind, uh, and it has a new name also. When that inner loop is gone, we refer to it as a cardioid, but it's part of the Limachon family. Another type of Limachon is the dimpled Limachon. 
Again, you'll either have this kind of equation or this one. You're seeing it, you know, with symmetry about the polar axis. So this would have been one with uh, the trig function cosine in it. And the way you get this dimpled limb, Sean, and that's when this vertex, instead of coming into the origin, as you see right here, it kind of hangs back. That's what we refer to as the dimple. And that's going to happen when the value, this A value, that comes before either a plus or minus is greater than the B value. You get that dimpled appearance. Then we have what almost looks like a circle, but is really part of the Limachon family. That's why it doesn't look as round here at the bottom um, as the actual circles that we looked at up here. This is known as a convex Limachon, and that will be whenever your A value is greater than or equal to uh, 2 times the B value. Okay, next we come to the family of roses. And the form of the equation will look um, like you see right under each picture. You'll have a constant times the sine of theta. And, when, and there's different types of things that happen with the petals. If this n value, this multiplier of theta, if that value right in there happens to be an even number, then double that number. Like, let's say it's a 2. If it's a 2, just double it. That's how many petals you're going to have on your rows. And then the length of each of the petals is suggested by this coefficient that's out front, the a value. And so when your um, rows function has the word sine in it, then you're going to have this kind of orientation that you see here. If you have cosine, I just, you know, it really depends on how many petals you have. But this is something that the n value was even. They're saying that the n value was 4, and when you double 4, you get 8 petals, and that's why you see 8 petals here. And they are spaced out and even. Now, each petal is an uh, equal number of degrees apart. In other words, this, this, this arc, and this arc, they're all spaced um, equally apart. And so if you have eight petals, they're spaced equally apart. So it's distributed amongst that 360-degree revolution. However, if you're also in, still in the rows family, with either sine or cosine presenting in the equation, if that multiplier of theta happens to be an odd number, then you have exactly that many petals. It's only when the multiplier is even that you double that number, and that's how many petals you have. Again, the, the coefficient out front, whether it's given in this form or this form, will be the length of the petal. So just a little review of what you can expect to see when you get these graphs in the calculator. There's also a lot in this section regarding um, converting polar equations into rectangular coordinates. In other words, getting the rectangular form of this equation and identifying what shape that's going to be based on your knowledge of algebra. So you've, you're coming into this class with about three algebra classes behind you. And in each one of them, they have spoken um, about circles, ellipses, hyperbolas, those kind of shapes. The main shape that's going to surface here is the circle. Uh, sometimes there'll be elliptical shapes, and those are the, but mainly the circle. And you're expected to know how to get something in a circular format, how to get a, an equation in rectangular form, and then get that rectangular equation in standard form to reveal the center of the circle as well as the radius so that you can pick the picture. So I'm going to re review with you some things that are um, taught in your algebra classes leading up to this class and will continue to be presented in your classes. So when you're trying to figure out how to transform these equations, what you're trying to do is to create expressions in the equation that you're going to be able to substitute the uh, rectangular expressions that you learned in section 9.1. So let's review those. One of the things that we learned from, I'll put them up here, from section 9.1,
is that the equivalent of r squared, when you're in a polar type equation, that is equivalent in the rectangular system to x squared plus y squared. So if you can get an r squared in any of the polar equations that you're going to be given in this section, you can substitute it with x squared plus y squared if you're trying to move into rectangular form. Other definitions that we received were that x is equivalent to r cosine theta. So if you see an r cosine theta in any of your polar equations, you can replace it with x if you're being asked to move into rectangular form. We were also given this definition, uh, that y is equivalent to r sine of theta. And then the last definition that we were given in section 9.1 is that tan of theta is equal to equivalent to y over x. And as I gave these formulas in section 9.1, I tried to point out to you that really all of these were given to you in section 6.2, second section of this class, and then we just continued to use them. <clears throat> okay, so moving into, and you got to get a little creative when you're trying to figure out what to do here, but you want to try and create um, terms in your equation where these definitions from 9-1 can be used. So instead of a r, I would like r squared, and I can create an r squared in two different ways. I can either multiply both sides by r, or I can just square each side. Now, I would just square each side if it's not going to create extra terms in your equation, extra variables. We want to kind of stay away from that. Extra trig expressions or extra variables that weren't there to begin, the, begin with. So if I just take this and I square this side, then I have to square this side as well because that's the key rule when working with equations that you are always doing the same thing to both sides. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so at that point, you have r squared is equal to 144, and we are trying to, once again, move into the rectangular form. That's what it means to get the equation in rectangular coordinates. It means get this in rectangular form. Just by substituting, we know from section 9.1 that r squared is equivalent to x squared plus y squared. So you're trying to get rid of all traces of r and theta, r and theta, excuse me, which those are just, you know, they signify that you're in polar form. Okay, so we no longer have any r's in this problem. We definitely don't have any thetas and never did. And so we are in rectangular form. This is the rectangular form of the equation that they started you with called r equal to 12. So now that it's in rectangular form, it now is the kind of equation that you would have seen in your previous algebra courses. And so we're looking for you to be able to recognize what kind of uh, shape this is. Anytime you have both variables to the second degree, both x and y to the second degree, both are positive and both have the same coefficient, then you are talking about a circle. You need to know how to identify the center of the circle as well as the radius of the circle so that you can graph it or choose a graph that represents it. So let's remember the standard form of a circle equation. Because we're going to use this in more than a couple of problems. Standard formula for a circle equation. Looks like this. It's x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared. Now any, um, any formula that has minuses in it, when you go to use, when you go to identify what the coordinates are at the center, if those coordinates, because the center is identified by h and k, but if in the formula there were minuses before those um, 
coordinates, you want to switch them before you identify them uh, for purposes of graphing. So in the equation, it might appear as x minus h. This really just indicates switch it before you name it as the center. So the center would be positive h. Switch this before you name it as the back coordinate for the center. And then this formula actually has a square right here. So when, you're, when you have a circle in standard form, it'll be x minus h squared, some expression containing x, x minus some constant squared, y minus some constant squared. You will switch the sign of the h, switch the sign of the k, and that will be your center. And then the value that you see here is said to be in its squared form. So when you go to identify the radius, you'll just simply take the square root. So the radius is just whatever the r value is. So in the equation, it appears in its squared form, and you will unsquare it by taking the square root. So compare that to what you are seeing here, the form that you have brought this equation to at this point. I mean, if you want it to look exactly like this, you could rewrite it as x minus 0 squared if you wanted to get it in exact standard form. Not that you have to go to that point because you can tell that even left in this um, form that it has a center of 0, 0. But you can write it like that if you like, just so that it exactly mimics the actual standard form of an equation. So when you remove these values, I mean, you if it was possible to switch the sign of uh, 0, I would tell you to do that, but it just happens to be the only number that doesn't have a sign. So you therefore it's impossible to switch it as you take them out. This is your h value. This is your k value. This is r squared, so r is just 12. So... What is the standard form of the equation? That's what we gave right here. x squared plus, you would just fill that right in there. What is it? You pick what kind of circle it is. It's a circle with center 0, 0, radius 12, not radius 144. It presents as r squared is in the equation. You have to unsquare it. In other words, take the square root in order to know what the radius is. Okay, then go and pick um, which um, multiple choice represents the graph. Now, there is a digital copy of this for you in your Blackboard course shell. And each of the actual um, graphs is in red, so you can see them a little bit better. But it's pretty obvious... Uh, which ones it is. I mean, in, I don't know if you can see this. I'll just darken it in. This is the graph in part B. This is the graph right there in part D. This is the graph right here. I'll just darken them in in red the way they look on the digital copy so I don't have to switch back and forth. And this is the graph for this one. So the reason why this graph, the choice, is obvious is because it can't possibly be this. The graph is not a vertical line. It cannot possibly be this one because the graph is not a horizontal line. And it can't be this one because the radius is too small. What you can't see very well in this diagram is that this was 10 and this ringlet goes out a little further, but that definitely is way smaller. So this was more in the lo in line of having a radius with 12. So this would have to be the choice for this particular graph. If you were looking at a digital copy or looking at the problem in your homework software, you'd be able to see it very, uh, very clearly how far out uh, the diameter goes. Okay, so that's number one. In example two, um, same type of problem. You're being asked to transform the polar equation to an equation in rectangular form. That's what it means to get the equation in rectangular coordinates and then identify the graph of the equation based on your knowledge of certain types of equations and the shapes that they create from algebra, what you learned in those classes. So right now, this is just a polar equation. Who knows what the shape is, but we can try and once again use those definitions that we learned from 9-1. And I'll just transfer them to this page. We know that r squared 
is equal to x squared plus y squared. We know that x is equal to r cosine theta. We also know that y is equal to r sine theta. And then we also know that tan of theta is equal to y over x. These give us ways to get rid of polar expressions and replace them with rectangular expressions. So what I'm thinking in this problem, I am not going to get this. There's no hint of even having an r squared here. There's no cosine word here. There's no sine word here. And this is not even there. But what I'm thinking is that if we take the tan of each side, we would have this equation. This would be equivalent to the equation that you started with right here. Take the tan of this side, it would say tan of theta. Take the tan of the other side, and it would say tan of pi over 6. And in this way, we could move into, start, we could begin to move into a rectangular equation. Like for instance, definition of tan of theta, y over x. And the tan at uh, pi over 6 is just a value. So let's recall what the tan of pi over 6 is. I'm going to come over here, try and write this a little bit better. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to get the value for tan at pi over 6. This is something that we've been doing the entire course, spinning to particular angles and then evaluating whatever trig function we're evaluating at that particular rotation. So here I go, rotating to pi over 6, which is nothing more than 30 degrees. If I had rotated to 30 degrees, your rotation is where this hypotenuse stopped. That would make this leg 1 half. It would make this leg square root of 3 over 2. When you do the tan value, it would be tan is equal to y over x. When you simplify this, you would simply bring the bottom fraction to the top so that that square root of 3 over 2 would no longer be in the bottom. The 2's would cancel, and I'll just keep simplifying this, and you would have tan is equal to 1 over square root of 3, which if you rationalize it, in other words, get rid of the radical in the denominator, it would be square root of 3 over 3. Okay, so I can come back to the main problem. I substituted tan of theta with y over x, its equivalent rectangular definition, and I can replace tan of pi over 6 so that I no longer have a trig word or an angle because those are all elements of the polar system, not the rectangular system. In the xy system, we don't have angles or thetas or r's or any of that or trig words. So to replace this entire thing, I can do so if I know a value that is equivalent to, to it, and that would be square root of 3 over 3, which we have just bothered to find. Okay, so now I have a rectangular equation, and if you want to get it in the form that equations always are, like when you get ready to graph them, you isolate the y. So I'm going to put it in that form up here. I can get that to happen by just cross multiplying, by swinging this x right up into the numerator on the other side. That's just cross multiplying one way. That would leave the y by itself and end up with this. Okay, now try to remember the algebra that you've learned. What kind of graph does this produce? When we were learning different shapes in our algebra courses, uh, we learned that anytime y and x are both first degree, this has to be a line, a straight line. More specifically, we learned that the coefficient of x, when it's in this form, you've isolated y, you've got an x on the other side, that this coefficient of x is the slope. And whenever your slope is positive, your line climbs upward and to the right. 
all lines with positive slopes climb upward and to the right. When their slope is negative, it climbs the other way, climbs upward and to the left. So what is the slope-intercept form? Slope-intercept form means give the equation just as we have given it right here. Slope-intercept form means that you have isolated your y variable. So y is equal to, giving this in slope-intercept form, square root of 3 over 3 times x. And again, that square root of 3 over 3 is the slope, which tells us what direction the graph moves in. So here are the graphs that they've given you. This one is a line that presents partly in quad 1, partly in quad 3. This one, so you'd have to actually know in order to pick between A and B, you'd have to know that when your slope is positive, that makes the line climb upward and to the right. It can, therefore, it cannot be B because this line, this darkened in line here, and I'm just putting it in red so you can see it even better, this goes in the wrong direction. The slope that you have in your problem could not possibly create a line that moves in this direction in quads two and four, no way. So that is not the answer. This is wrong because it's a horizontal line and we most definitely did not get a horizontal line. Your equation is your equation will be first degree but missing one of the letters when it's a horizontal line. We'll talk about that. So it can't possibly be this graph and it can't possibly be this graph. This graph is a vertical line. So these are all out of the question. Make Again, if you have any knowledge of um, the graphs that you've learned in previous classes, then you can rule out uh, all the answers pretty quickly except for one. Okay, and I don't think I answered up here. Uh, what is the graph of this equation? A line in quads 1 and 3. This is quad 1. This is quad 3. Passes through both of those quadrants. So choice A, as you describe uh, the kind of uh, graph that this uh, equation suggests, and then actually picking your graph. Okay, those are the three parts of the answer. The equation choosing a description, choosing a graph. Okay, moving on to example three. In example three, we have r sine of theta equal to four. And based on those definitions that I keep writing for you from section 9.1, this is actually one of the definitions that we learned, that r sine of theta is the same thing as y. So this is the rectangular version of that polar equation. We no longer have r, nor do we have theta, simply by making that substitution that relates r and sine theta to y. Okay, so y equal to 4 is the standard form of the equation in rectangular form. Now, what kind of line is this? Well, anytime you're plotting a bunch of points that have a y coordinate of 4, that is always a horizontal line. It's just a bunch of points that are up at, all up at a height of y equal to 4. The x could be anything. <clears throat> so let's see, this would be choice C horizontal line and then go and pick um, the answer which again there's only one graph here that has a horizontal line because this one is a vertical line this one's a little circle this one's a little circle okay so it has to be choice B pretty easy that one okay moving on to example four in example four, it says transform the polar equation, just as we have done in numbers one, two, and three, and then identify and graph the equation. Okay, so let's see, what do we have? Here is the equation right over here. Now, we learned a definition for R cosine theta. So I uh, definitely want r squared here rather than just r, so I can plug in the definition for r squared without 
you know, throwing a radical into the equation. And I would love it if this said R cosine theta, so I could just put an X in. So what you can do instead of squaring this side and then having to square this side, because imagine if you did this the same way I did, um, let's see, which problem was that? This was actually example one, where I started off with this, but getting that r squared by just squaring both sides was okay because I created the r squared I wanted and in squaring the other side I didn't throw in any extra trig words, I didn't throw in an extra theta. This was simplistic enough that even squaring that I didn't throw in anything that was related to the polar system by squaring each side. However, on this problem that we're doing right now, in example four, um, that's not going to work. Because if I square this side and then also square this side, I'll create a uh, 64, no problem. But I'm, then I'm going to have cosine squared. And then what do you do with that? It's not enough of the Pythagorean identity to help you get rid of it. So another way to create an R squared which I do want so that I can plug in x squared plus y squared and move into the rectangular system is just to multiply each side by r. That way you get an r squared on the left and you could wedge this right in here. So that you now have something that's equivalent to x. I'm going to replace r cosine theta with its def the way it's defined in the rectangular system, which is with an x. r cosine theta is equal to x, and r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. This brings me into your knowledge of completing the square. Okay, again, I'm going to review with you that this is a circle. It is a circle because it has three character characteristics that identify it as a circle. You have both x and y squared. That's one of the characteristics. You have that they are both positive, and you have that the coefficients are equal. Those are the three things that are required for this to be a circle. Okay, with no other terms having any degrees higher than that. So this is going to be a circle, and the, the point will then be, how do I figure out what the center and the radius is so that I can pick out a picture or graph it by hand, if that's what's required. So we come into, uh, we require at this point a procedure called completing the square. You can complete the square on variables where for that particular variable you have a second degree version of that variable as well as a first degree version of that variable. Notice that that is happening for the x family. You have a second degree x, you have a first degree x, and only for families that have that happening can you complete the square. So we're going to be able to complete the square on our x family. Okay, you need to get everything on one side. So I'm going to bring this over here. This arrow is the same thing as saying I'm adding 8x and adding 8x. Or you can just look at it like this. When you move a term from one side to the other through addition, it um, assumes the opposite sign once it jumps to the other side. So it's x squared plus 8x, put all your x family members together, and since you will be completing the square on this family, leave room for one extra term, because when you complete the square, you are creating what's called a perfect square trinomial, and that is, um, you know, an expression with three terms. So we're going to be going for that third term. So leave room for that third term in your x family. For this y squared term, which is also on the left side, you don't have a linear version of the y variable. You have only a squared term. Therefore, you will not be completing the square on the y family. 
Since I moved the negative 8x to the left side, we have nothing on this side. And continue. Now, the steps for completing the square. They happen at the linear variable. You're going to take the linear coefficient and you're going to cut it in half, which is 4. Then you're going to square it. So it consists of uh, two steps to get that third term. Cut that linear coefficient in half, then take that and cut and square it. And this new term creates what's called a perfect square trinomial. We used to have a binomial in our X family, now we have a trinomial. But this 16 that you just entered right here, that was not in the uh, original problem. It is something that you just added to the left side, and therefore you must also add it to the right side. Okay, make sure that you're always keeping your equations balanced. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do it to the other side as well. Now, the thing about perfect square trinomials is that in order for it to start resembling the standard form of a circle equation, you need to factor it. And perfect square trinomials factor super easy. All of them factor like this. No matter what method you use, guess and check if you wanted to use that to factor it, splitting the middle term if you wanted to use that method for factoring it. There's a lot of ways to factor, you know, there's several ways to factor trinomials. And we usually concentrate. But this happens to have a shortcut. Anything that's a perfect square trinomial, all you have to do to get it factored rather than using any of those more extensive methods is to take the square to the front, square root of the back. So square to the front, x. Square to the back, 4. And then the sign that's in front of the linear term that we were doing all our work on to create this 16, that's the sign that joins them. So now we have this perfect square trinomial all factored. There was also a y squared term on that side and a 16 on this side. We now have this in standard circle formation. Okay, so when we go to say, what is the center? Any expression that has a number added or subtracted to it, because, and this is because, once again, the standard form of a circle equation is like this. And formulas that have minuses in them they mean that what that actually means is to switch the sign as you take these values out for graphing purposes, which is exactly what we're doing. These values that I'm plucking out of here, and you know, this term, this y squared can be written as y minus zero if you like, if you really want it to look just like this one, where you have either a plus or a minus and then some number inside the parentheses, but there's no need to write it like that. You can leave it just like that. Okay, if there's no number added or subtracted to your squared term, that means the value that's with it is a zero. If you want, if you're more comfortable rewriting it, do that. Okay, so the center is switch that sign, front coordinate, or in other words, the x coordinate, also known as the h value, is negative four. There was no value being added or subtracted from this y squared expression. Therefore, the k value is 0. This is our squared. When anything is in standard circle formation, the value you're seeing there is r squared. So if you unsquare it, you're really just taking the square root. So we are looking for a circle below that has a center at negative 4, 0, and a radius of 4. And that center is what's going to help you rule out a couple of these pictures. I mean, we can definitely, as we're selecting it, and let's choose one of these first. Let's go ahead and fill these things in. So this was my equation here, x plus 4 squared plus 
y squared is equal to 16. Okay, and then what a description of the graph, circle with center, negative 4, 0. If they don't talk about the radius, then don't worry about it. Definitely not a horizontal line, definitely not a circle with positive 4, 0, but you have to know um, how to react to this equation when pulling the numbers out, because otherwise you're going to be accidentally choosing that as an answer, and it's definitely not a vertical line. Okay, with respect to which of these graphs has a center of negative 4, 0 and a radius of 4, I think just from the center you should be able to pick it. And you can definitely rule out graphs right away. This graph right here, this darkened in line represents the graph, and you know that it's not that one. The, this graph can also be ruled out because it's the graph was that darkened in line right there. I'm just putting them in red for you. Um, and that can be ruled out. Then we're choosing from these two remaining graphs, which are both circles, but only one of them uh, can possibly have a center of negative 4, 0. I mean, if you move to the center of this, you're at a positive x value, but the center would have a y coordinate of 0. So this can't possibly be it because the center is at positive 4, 0. Whereas this one can be it because you have you have the possibility of having a center at negative 4, 0 here. Process of elimination, that is the graph that goes with that. Okay, moving to sample 5. In example 5, so we start off trying to think how we can replace these polar expressions, thetas, trig words, r's, with things where we can substitute x, y, the x, y expressions that we learned in section 6.2 and in section 9.1. So let's see. I don't know that I'm going to go the r squared route because I think I can just put in something we learned again in section 6.2, and that is that secant of theta is the same thing as r over x. So rewriting this equation, you would have r times secant, and the definition of secant is r over x which is equal to 5. At that point, if we clean up a little bit, we have r times r, r squared over x is equal to 5. If we get rid of the fractional nature of this problem, we could just do that by cross multiplying, which would be r squared is equal to 5x. If we completely get rid of all signs of anything polar, we can move into, um, instead of r squared, x squared plus y squared is equal to 5x. Okay, so we now have, again, this is what we did, plugged in all, the definition of secant, of secant of theta is r over x. <coughs> Multiplied these together to get r squared over x. Cross multiplied to get rid of the fraction. Then I had r squared at that point is equal to 5x. Replace the r squared with x squared plus y squared. And then just like the problem that I just did, um, you have both x squared and y squared and no power any higher than that. Both of these terms are positive. And um, let's see, and they both have the same coefficient. They both have a coefficient of 1, the three things that are required for this to be a circle. So since this already tells you that it's a circle, you just now at this point want to know more about the circle, like what is the center? What is the radius? Because only with that information can you pick the graph that goes with this equation. So again, what we do to reveal the center and the radius is we complete the square. Complete the square. 
Okay, the family that you're going to be able to complete the square on in this particular problem is the X family. Notice that you have a squared term in your X family as well as a linear term in your X family. You need a second degree and a first degree term to be able to complete the square, and you need all these terms to be on the same side. So you're going to have X squared, bring this 5X to the opposite side, and it would then present as negative 5X. So negative 5x, and leave room to create one more extra term when you create your perfect square trinomial, because a perfect square trinomial is the result of completing the, square, uh, the steps that you go through to complete the square. Let's see, what other terms are on this side? There's an x squared, a negative 5x, there's a y squared. We will not be able to complete the square on the y family because you don't have a linear term in that family. And then everything was brought to one side, so the right side of this equation is now zeroed out. Okay, in completing the square, you are cutting the linear coefficient in half, which is negative 5 halves, and then you're squaring that number that you just cut in half. <coughs> and that would give you 20 5 over 4. That goes here. So this is a brand new number that you introduced to the left side of the equation and therefore since you added 25 over 4 to the left side you have to add 25 over 4 to the right side to keep this equation balanced as it was in its original state. However, we're going to take this and we're going to Factor it. Any time that you factor a perfect square trinomial, you're really just talking, taking the square to the front, square to the back. So we're going to square root this front term. We're going to square root this back term, which is, let's see, square to the top is 5, square to the bottom is 2. And then we are going to join these two terms by the sign in front of the linear term and put a square there. It's all factored. It's x minus 5 half squared, already looking like some of the answers that we're seeing here. Okay, let's bring down these other terms. So and let me move this up just a bit. Get it out of my way a little bit. Okay, so there was a positive y squared that I'm going to drop down. And when I combine 0 and 25 over 4, it is 25 over 4, and that enables me to now uh, choose the equation. Once again, let me return your memory to the fact that this is a circle equation in standard form because it now is not only does it tell you that it's a circle, which again, let's review. How do you know it's a circle? Both the x expression and the y expression, they're both squared. They both have the same coefficient out here. There's a coefficient of 1 here, there's a coefficient of 1 here, and they're both positive. That makes this a circle. But this gives a lot more information than what you knew at the beginning, because we knew way back here that it was a circle. But now we know it's a circle, and we also know what the center and the radius is. So the center, to get the front coordinate of the center, known as the h, it's really just the x coordinate at the center. It's just that at the center, the x and the y is called h and k. By switching this sign before stating what it is, this doesn't even have a number with it. That's the same thing as y minus 0. And you can't switch the sign on that. So there's your center. And then this is r squared. When it's in standard form, the number that you're seeing there is r squared. This is x minus h squared, y minus k squared, and this is r squared. And so the r is just the square root of that, 5 over 2. Okay, so now picking the equation from these choices here. We, we need something with an x minus 5 squared, so it can't be that, can't be that. So x minus 5 half squared in both of these 
uh, we have a Y squared in both of these. They still match, but over here you should see exactly what you see in the equation, 2504. So it can't be because of this. It can't be this one. It has to be this one. This one has a 25 over 4 on the right-hand side. So choice C. Okay, then moving to actually picking the graph. Knowing the center and the radius will allow us to pick the graph. And, um, okay, so let's see. Radius of positive 5 halves. Now, look where the 5 halves is. It's in the x position. 5 halves is the same thing as 2.5. So when you're going out to the center of the circle in any of these graphs below, you should be moving out 2.5 on the x-axis and 0 units up on your y-axis. So which graph is that? Okay, and the pictures, if you don't see them here clearly enough, this is one of the circles here. This is another circle. They just this doesn't print out when you try to print it out. That was another circle. This was a circle. Each one of these you can tell, you know, what the signs are. On the center, the coordinates that are at the center. Okay, so if you were to try and name the center of this, it's possible that this would have a positive 2.5 as the x coordinate, um, as the uh, as the x coordinate at the center, and zero for the y coordinate. That's a possibility. This is not possible. If you move to the center of this one. This is like implying that the center, I mean, the coordinates of, the, of the, this kind of point, look at the coordinates of that center point. It's zero and something, and they're implying that that's the 2.5. Okay, well, we didn't get that center. This one is more possible, because if you move out 2.5 units, you could land right in the center of that, even though you can't see the numbers. Clearly, you have the possibility of that being 2.50. This is, It's not even a possibility here because the coordinates of that center point are zero something. And we didn't get a zero for our uh, x coordinate or what we call our h coordinate. So that's out of the question. This one's also out of the question. This has got a center of zero, zero. So because these things are happening and they are not in line with the center that we got, it's what allows us to rule them out. So know how to complete the square so you know what the center is so you can rule out all graphs except one. This one right here, if you were to move to the center of that circle, that x coordinate would be negative. So if they're implying that that is 2.5, it would have to be negative 2.5 and we did not get this kind of center. Just like we didn't get this kind of center. And this is com completely wrong. Okay, so everything is ruled out except choice A, and A is the proper graph. Okay, moving on to example six. Now we get to produce our own polar graphs. And we're going to be doing that with the calculator. So just demonstrating for you how to use that calculator. Uh, first thing that you're going to want to do when you're producing your own uh, polar graphs is to make sure that your mode is all set up. So your mode needs to be in radians, just like when you did trig graphs, and you need to be in polar mode because the equations need to be typed in and, um, for R, and you're going to switch your calculator over to that mode. So mode, radians are required and also that you be in polar mode. Okay, so just get in, push the mode key, 
which is the quick key. Get on top of radians. Press enter to accept that choice. Get on top of polar right there. Press enter to absorb that choice and then quit out of this screen. Second quit. Okay, now I'm going to do what you always do when you go to uh, use your calculator to do uh, graphs. So press y is equal to. Clear out whatever is there and type in your equation, which is 4 minus 4 sign the sign key and then the key that has x t theta n and it will give you a theta since you're in polar mode press enter so your calculator absorbs this entire equation and then you can go to some pre-made windows right here on the zoom key if you press zoom you have lots of choices each one um, particularly conducive for uh, certain types of equations and when you're doing polar equations or trig equations choice seven is nice zoom trig I mean we do mess around with zoom square zoom standard zoom trig these have all been helpful in producing trig graphs um, but I would try zoom trig first to see if you can see the shape again those shapes are reviewed on page one in that table but this is, um, is going to be a cardioid. Cardioid is when that inner loop gets taken away. It's from the Limachon family. You can arrow down to 7 or you can just press 7 and you'll get the shape. If you want to see the full shape, so this is uh, from the Limachon family, but there, it has no inner loop. That's because the A and the B value right here are the same. If you want to see it all the way down to the bottom, then manually adjust the window. Instead of uh, right next to the zoom key, just go to window, and you can give yourself more of a lower Y axis, which is called Y min. I'm going to take it down to negative 10. I mean, not that you couldn't pick uh, what it is if it's a multiple choice question, but that's the full graph. This is called a, a cardioid. And they're going to ask you, what, did it, what is it symmetric to? This horizontal axis, which by the way, just a little review, is called the polar axis. And this line right here is called the line theta is equal to pi over 2. So if you have forgotten that from section 9.1, let me remind you, because you do have two choices here that say cardioid. When they say uh, symmetric with respect to such and such or symmetric to the polar axis, that means the graph wraps around it. Okay, so let's just remember the names of the what you used to call the x-axis when you were in the xy system. That's now called the polar axis. This was in section 9.1. This, the new name for that was the pole. And this line right here, even though you may not think you know it, this is all the way back from section 6.2. Uh, when you rotate to theta equal to pi over 2, you're at, you're on this axis that you have been used to calling the y-axis. So this is called the axis uh, theta equal to pi over 2. This one's called the polar axis. So notice that in this graph that we got, that this wraps around. It has symmetrical portions, like mirror images on either, th either side of this uh, vertical axis, which is called theta equal to pi over 2. And therefore, it is this answer. The shape is a cardioid. Okay, then come down here and pick the actual graph. All you've done is choose a, you've selected a description of the graph. So in that case, you'd have to know the names of the graphs. Okay, so all of these cardioids open in the wrong direction except for um, choice D. This one opens to the left, wrong, that is not what we got. This one opens to the right, we didn't get that either. This one opens up, we didn't get that. It did open down from the vertex, it made that heart shape and then opened downward. Okay, then moving to 
example number seven and an example number seven. It says identify and graph the polar equation. So um, let's see, let's get a graph of that. Okay, so we're going to type in just exactly what we see here, 8 cosine, and this is 4 theta. Now what you're seeing here, again, shapes are reviewed on the first page of this outline, is a rose. When this is even, this multiplier on theta, when it's even, you double up that number, and that's how many petals there are. If anyone prompts you with how long are the petals, well, they would also have a length. This is the A value that's out here. This is called the N value. So when N is even, we double up that N value, and it tells you how many petals to expect to see. And then the length of each petal is controlled by that A value. And no, this does not always match how many petals there are. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to press Enter to absorb that entire equation. I'm going to stick with a zoom trig window. Let me see. Yep, got a bunch of petals here, and there are eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and if you want to see the whole thing, you could all, always give yourself, you know, control. The, if you have to answer a specific question on the graph, you could always give yourself more X min, more X max, instead of going to just 6.15. Same thing for your Y min. Whoops, that should be in, well, min's should be negative. And I could do y max 12. So I'll just give you more of an axis each, each, each way, and you'll be able to see the entire thing. Okay, but you still, even without expanding the window, you can still tell that it's a rose with eight petals. And you can see the way they're wrapped. There's one wrapped uh, upward on theta equal to pi over 2 and downward. There's a petal right on the polar positive side of the polar axis as well as the negative side so all things that in case you have two graphs uh, that are close that will help you select okay so this was a rose with eight petals which graph represents the equation not that one not enough petals this one looks just like it upward downward side right side left side too few petals this is the answer there was only three graphs there uh, for that one. Okay, moving on to example eight. So these are a little easier because you're just example six and on because you're just doing um, the graph inside your calculator and answering, you know, which graph mat matches. I mean, the most that you would have to know that you're going to have to get yourself familiar with, with is the names of the graphs. Okay, so then going on to example eight. This is also a rose. Notice that when it's a rose, it'll have the word sine or cosine. You'll have some kind of number out front, which will be how long the petals are. And then you'll even you'll either have an even multiplier of theta, which then you double up that number to get the number of petals, or you'll have an odd number. And when the n value is odd, you have exactly that many petals. It's when it's even that you double it up, and that's how many petals you have. And the length of each petal is 9. Okay, and now you'll see that as you put this in the calculator. And you could go um, 9 sine of 3 theta, close it, press Enter, and graph. 
Okay, and there is a very nice picture right there where you can see everything. Okay, so this is a rose with three petals. Um, and which graph does it represent? Well, this is a lemniscate shape. This is one with five petals. This is the one that we just got from our calculator. Okay, moving on to number nine. Identifying graph the polar equation. This is a lemniscate. So from that table presented on the first page of this outline, when you have R squared, it's the only one we've done like this, and then a value here that's some value squared. This is 6 squared. And then you would have to have a 2 theta in here. Cosine should be in its first degree form, or you could have sine first degree form. Now this you're going to have to enter in pieces in your calculator because your calculator will not accept an R squared so you're going to take the square root. So we're going to take the square root here which will give us R and then we're going to have to take the square root of this side also. But on the side um, that's not squared that's where you report both the positive and the negative root. So on this side, it's plus or minus. The only thing that's going to actually come out from underneath this square root symbol is the 36. You could actually take the square root of that, and it'll come out as whatever the square root is, which is 6. And then the trig word will, will stay underneath the radical. So when you go to feed this into your calculator, you have to feed it in as two separate pieces. The positive version of what you have on the right side of this equation will give you the top portion of the graph of the lemniscate, and the negative version, which you're going to feed in as R2, will give you the uh, lower portion of the graph. You're not going to get a completely a complete graph. The middle part of the middle uh, portion will be missing. So we're going to enter it like this in the calculator. R1 will be 6, positive 6, cosine 2 theta, and then as R2, you're going to enter in negative square root of cosine 2 theta. Now this is just when you when your equation starts with r squared. You've got to feed it in in pieces. So clear that out. So one of them is 6. Call up the square root symbol and underneath it feed in cosine 2 theta. Close that parenthesis. Close the first parenthesis. Press enter. Come down and now do the negative version. Call up that square root symbol again. Go cosine 2 theta. Close, close. And then I'm going to do zoom. Option 7. Yeah, so it'll give you most of it. Just this portion's missing. It doesn't close it for you, but you can still tell it's the only shape that's remotely um, close to it. It's the only shape that looks anything like an infinity symbol, so that would have to be this one right here. You can see from your calculator that you have x this polar axis orientation. I always want to call it the x-axis, but it's the polar axis. Okay, so this is called a lemniscate. It looks like an infinity symbol. Okay, then this uh, number 10. Uh, the only thing I can warn you about here, they're already telling you what the shape is going to be an ellipse, which is like a flattened out circle, is that you need to wrap that denominator in parentheses. Anytime your denominator has more than one term, you're going to want to encase it in parentheses so that your calculator does that value first and then goes to divided by that value. So you won't get the right shape otherwise. So let's... Uh, clear out what's in here from the last problem and feed this in. So it's 2 divided by 3 minus 2 um, sine theta. Oops, I forgot to put the parentheses around it. So 2 divided by, put my parentheses and put that expression 3 minus 2 sine theta close close 
that goes with that, and this parenthesis goes with the first one. Okay, so then I'm going to do zoom option seven, zoom trig. That's option seven. You can just press seven instead of arrowing down. And we get a nice little ellipse. Okay, let's look at what we have. The options. Whoops, I'm not showing you. Let's look at the options that we have. I entered this in for R. I put a parenthesis around the bottom though, and I just pressed zoom tree. Okay, so that would be, let's see. It started slightly below the polar axis and went upward on the axis theta equal to pi over two, which looks like choice A. This goes in the wrong direction, this goes in the wrong direction, this goes in the wrong direction. So this is the one that looks like, just like what we got in the calculator. Okay, moving to the last example. And the last example is the spiral of Archimedes. Looks like the inside of a conch shell. And so we're just going to press in the equation there, r equal to theta. So just put a theta there, enter, graph. And you see that it starts, the stem starts right there at the pole and then continues through quads two, three, and four. And notice the direction that it curls in so you can um, distinguish between the options that you have here. Okay, so let's see, not this one goes in the, this one curls in the wrong direction. Um, this one seems to be right choice C, starting at the pole, or what's known as you, you know, it's origin in the XY system, but the pole and polar system. So it goes like that. Yeah, notice that that curl be in when we did it was in this little curl was in quad one. So you want to pick the graph that has the curl in that quadrant. Okay, this has the curl in the wrong place. This has the curl in the wrong place. You have to check where the spiral is. Okay, so that completes section 9.2 for trigonometry.